Making Ready Player One. Yay. Who am I? My name is not important. Anyway, uh, what we're talking about here is, is using video game technology actually on a stage uh, when making a CGI movie and how that's changing how movies are actually made. Uh, what's happening with, with Ready Player One and before that Jungle Book, since it's the same team that sort of built that stuff, is we're completely changing how movies are made. The whole editing process, uh, the way things are captured, um, even the way that the production is designed in the first place is completely changing and it's, it's kind of fun. Um, I've been kicking around the industry for a while, uh, 35 years. My first game was on a Commodore 64, which was embarrassing. Um, <clears throat> I've got one foot in the video game industry and one foot in the movie industry. I worked for Bob Zemeckis for two and a half years when he was at Image Movers Digital, and I helped make um, Christmas Carol and Mars Needs Moms and was working on the ill-fated revamp of Yellow Submarine before Disney cancelled it. Um, I was lucky enough to come in on the end of Jungle Book and work on... Um, Ready Player One, which was pretty cool, all things considered. I've been around for a while. I worked at Midway in their golden, golden years on arcade games. I worked at Raven on Star Trek Elite Force and Jedi Knight and Soldier of Fortune. Worked on Sims 2 at EA and other stuff like that. But basically, I'm just old. So, yes, we have to have the obligatory uh, video that makes it all seem really exciting. So what you're looking at right now, actually, here, this is Stephen using the VCAM, the virtual camera technology that I'm about to go into. That's actually him using it. That's what he's seeing through the VCAM itself there. It's also reproduced here. And I'm actually floating around in the back here somewhere uh, while he's working. So what are we talking about here? Well, the, the actual technology that I helped build is uh, virtual cameras. Um, Virtual cameras are used in many different ways, and the software is actually used in more ways than just on the actual camera that's used on the stage. Um, it's used in previs, it's used on the mocap stage, it's used for camera, ca uh, camera path capture. It's used in a whole bunch of different ways, and we'll get into it in just a second. So what is a virtual camera? Well, it's supposed to be a window in a, in a CGI world, which is a bit romantic, but whatever. Um, it's an iPad, basically, with grips. So it's a window, and as you move it around, you can see in the world, which we'll see in a second. So it, it not only does it show you what the virtual rendered world is going to look like, but it also should show you the actors as they are moving in the mocap facility as their final retargeted characters. And there's this step called retargeting that comes in the middle uh, of capture from the mocap system before you can actually render the characters. And the idea is that um, when you're capturing Mark Ruffalo, who's the Hulk, Mark Ruffalo doesn't have the same body dimensions as the Hulk does. So you can't just take his skeleton and scale it. You actually have to move his shoulders apart and put in uh, um, constraints so that his arms don't go through his body and things like that. So there's a retargeting step that happens before you can see the final character. But thankfully, it can be done in real time so that you can actually see the actors moving in real time without any lag. Um, so they look kind of like this. You've got your little box here. Um, with your LCD screen, these are the markers so the motion capture system can pick it up. And then there's grips with controllers on it that allow you to move the camera around, do tracking shots with it, uh, turn on different camera lenses, things like that, whatever you decide to associate the buttons to do. So this is how they're actually used. So this is an example of a, a VCAM being used. You can see in the, the inset there what he's seeing. So that as he moves the camera around, the view is actually changing. Um, there's another little video that comes in after this one where, for, uh, where it was used on Rogue One. This is the Rogue One um, footage that their Lucasfilm is using their uh, VCAM, their small VCAM. Theirs is actually wireless, which is kind of nice. But they're demonstrating there. You can see it moving as the, as, 
uh, as the, the director is using the, the controller. This is what Gareth Edwards used on um, Rogue One. So how are these things revolutionary movies? Um, they change the flow completely. Editing, for example, now takes place on a stage. Um, and I'll go into that in a minute with Jungle Book. So all the camera positions that you're going to use, you're actually going to render out in the final movie are created in stage in real time. And because it's being done in real time, you can do as many of these shots as you actually want. So instead of just, uh, in a traditional movie, you have one camera and that's where it's placed. And then if you want to have a different camera angle later, you have to remount the entire um, uh, stage. You have to rebuild your set, bring the actors back in, make sure they look the same, make sure they're the same um, uh, costumes, and reshoot it from a different angle. With this, you don't need to. You can, you've got the actors acting recorded as a mo cap stream, so you can play it back at any time and add new camera angles. Um, <clears throat> you can use multiple camera angles. You can have multiple V-cams on a stage at one time, all looking at different things. So it's effectively like a three-camera stage or something like that if you want to. If you want a new camera angle later, you can just add it. It's really easy. So it completely changes the mechanics of how you shoot. Um, when you're actually recording the mocap, you don't care where the camera is because you're not even actually recording the, the actors with a camera. You're recording them with the mocap system. So for Jungle Book is a really interesting case in point which really shows how movies are changed. Jungle Book was actually shot twice as a movie. It was shot once purely from motion capture before um, Neil Sethi actually stepped foot on stage. It was shot entirely with a, with small, a, a small guy actor uh, and the whole thing was shot as a mocap movie. It was rendered, every frame of the movie was rendered in Unity. Uh, it was cut using the Unity renders as a complete movie, and then that was submitted to uh, Disney, who then approved it before they shot one frame with Neil Sethi himself, which is not a bad thing when you've got an 11 year old on your stage who doesn't know how to act most of the time. Um, <clears throat> but it was amazing in that Disney saw the entire movie in the middle of production, they knew exactly what they were going to get, they knew where the cameras were going to be, they knew what the lighting was going to be, they knew exactly what the movie was going to be. And it was literally cut on the stage as they were, they were recording this thing with um, the mocap actors. They would literally shoot something, put a camera track in it, John Favreau would go, yeah, I like that, no, I don't like that, can we put a camera up there? And we'd move the camera and try it again, and he'd, he'd, he'd like little shots. And we literally had an editor on stage cutting this thing as we were recording it which is completely different from how movies are normally done. So the, the, director, could, um, direct, the director and the, um, the editor could literally sit there and go, well, I don't like this, I like that. Oh, can we get another angle? It'd be really good if we could cut from over the shoulder or something like that. And they could literally create that camera right there and then make it work and be done. Um, all the creative decisions then were made on stage at the time when people were actually um, uh, recording this stuff. Uh, one of the nice sub, um, things that falls out of that is that you don't have to have the actors come in to do reshoots afterwards because you've got it all on stage at the time when you had the actors in the first place. Most actors actually have a clause in their contract that requires them to come in for 10 days of reshoots after movies are finished making, finished being made. All the Marvel movies do, for example. Um, <clears throat> and for Ready Player One, we actually ended up with one morning of reshoots and that was it. And the only reason we did those reshoots was simply because some of the data actually got corrupted and we had to reshoot that particular scene. That was the only reason. Um, every, we knew everything else we were doing. It was all done on stage at the time. So Ready Player One used the same technology as Jungle Book, um, only more, bigger, better, faster, and actually used VR on set as well, which I'll get into in a moment as well. There was a complete revised workflow. We basically took the experience of Jungle Book and made it much, much smoother. Pretty much everything in, on uh, Jungle Book was jury-rigged uh, with lots of Python scripts and glue and all that kind of stuff. We, that was being made up as it went along. We knew what we were doing for Ready Player One, so we went back and rebuilt all of our pipelines and made it much, much more efficient. Um, we could do better rendering. We could put more people on the stage. We actually had 10 actors all at once um, on a mocap stage being recorded in... Uh, 120 hertz, which is unheard of. Um, <clears throat> we were able to do better VFX. Um, we could do things like handoffs as well, which 
when you're in a motion capture stage, imagine one actor is handing something to another. Um, uh, a key is being handed. Well, that key doesn't physically exist. It's not there. So you, you, you're looking like you're handing something, and we actually, inside of the, the Unity software, could actually put something in someone's hand and make it jump to someone else's hand actually on stage in real time. And uh, Stephen really loved that, and so did um, the ILM guys. Uh, and it said more bald people, and that's because pretty much everybody who was involved on visual effects actually on the stage was bald. It was really weird. Even Stephen mentioned it. So... <clears throat> So the workflow for uh, Ready Player One was kind of like this. So large motion capture stage. In actual fact, the one that they built at Leavesden Studios in um, Watford was at the time the largest motion capture stage in the world. Uh, it was only built just for, that, for the actual recording of this movie and then it was uh, struck down later. But uh, the idea was that for an individual scene, you'd have all the actors on stage that needed to be there. Uh, usually, in, in this case of Ready Player One, it was usually only three or four, um, unless there were crowd scenes like in the, uh, in the nightclub scene. We actually had ten actors on stage for that. Um, so Stephen or whoever would record the actors, and he would have the, the VCAM on him, and he'd be using it just to sort of get an idea of what the actors were doing and what it might look like in the final product. But he wasn't really recording the camera at that point. He was just using it as a, as a visualizer. Um, <clears throat> the actors would do their scenes, and he would you know, do like four or five takes of this particular scene, or whatever scene it was doing, he would do four or five takes, and then he'd be like, okay, I'm happy now. I've got the performance that I think I should get. Um, and then they would they'd basically finish that scene, and they would go away and start doing setup for the next scene. And sometimes there were props required on the stage. The uh, DeLorean, for example, was an actual physical prop, although it wasn't a real DeLorean, obviously. It was just an outline of frame for it, which I had some pictures of that, but unfortunately, taking pictures on the stage with your phone would uh, be instant, instant dismissal. So I wasn't able to do that. Um, <clears throat> but they would be moving things around, generally getting the next stage, the next scene set up. And while that was happening, Stephen, right, so the mocap obviously is recorded onto the big data storage, which I missed there. So it's recorded on a big thing. Stephen would then go into a smaller mocap studio that we had on the side, and he would lay down camera tracks. And I was saying the idea, he said, use this little, um, the, the VCAM device, and he would record positions of the camera. So the, the, we'd play back the actors acting, and he'd be watching them, and he'd be moving this camera and moving it around and doing whatever he wanted to do. And we'd be recording the track of that particular camera uh, for the final product. And what's more, the VCAM software it was able to emulate pretty much any camera and lens setup imaginable. So it even would say things like, I want a Panaflex camera with a 50 millimeter lens, and we could reproduce exactly what you would see through a 50 millimeter lens on a Panaflex camera uh, on the VCAM itself. Uh, we had a list of, I think, 20 different cameras and about 40 different lenses that he could select from. And that's some of the, the buttons that we were talking about earlier on on the, the VCAM. He can cycle through them, decide what he wants, and all the rest of it. Um, <clears throat> so he would literally do 20 or 30 different camera positions and track them through the shot. Um, and we'd, we'd call them all, and then he'd play them back, and he'd go, right, I'd like... I'd like the track number four, track number seven, track number eight, and track number 12. Um, and then we would, and forgive me for the image here, when you put in Google you want um, a stack of computers, that's actually what you get. Um, <clears throat> but we would render the, uh, the, the scenes that he had just asked for with the camera tracks that he just laid down. We do what we call a near time render, which is where we would turn on inside of Unity everything we could turn on. Motion, blur, depth of field, bloom, all the rest, all the kind of stuff you can't turn on in real time. Um, we would turn on and do a nice, prettier, much prettier render, render, and then he would literally sit there and go, right, I'd like time code from here to here of that one, time code here and here of that one, and time code here of here of that one, and we would cut it together, like video edit it basically together right there and then. So he would get that complete sequence done whilst they're setting up the next shot on the main motion capture stage. It was incredibly efficient. Um, we were all very happy with it. Um, occasionally a few raised temperatures, but it was pretty, you know, pretty good. It was, uh, it was really educational in that this stuff is being edited in real time on the stage. Like, that just is something completely new. 
Um, and then at the end of it, you ended up with a basic edited scene. Now, let's be clear, you know, Unity is capable of a lot of things, and so is Unreal, but we're not looking at anything like a final rendered scene. So this, what we would produce at the end of it was a Unity scene, and it, the Unity scene itself was correctly lit, had proper lighting in it, where the lights were intended to be, um, the camera tracking was all correct, and the camera itself, in terms of the definition of the lenses used, was all correct and present and correct. And that was what we handed to ILM, and ILM would then take that and the original FBX that defined the scene and then would go, right, here we go. And they'd replace all of the models and do the high resolution rendering and all the high resolution models and the pretty, um, the pretty shader effects and all the rest of it. But it was effectively exactly what we shot on the stage. It was quite amazing to see the same things we'd seen on stage and then see them in the movie theater and see absolutely fantastic versions of them. And ILM really did a fantastic job there, there's no doubt about it. So VR, how did VR get used? Well, it got used in multiple ways, actually. Um, <clears throat> the most obvious way, of course, was making the actors aware of what they're, they're actually acting against. Remember, they're all in mocap suits in a, white, in a sort of gray, sterile environment. And you can say, oh, there's this thing over here. But don't, you, know, you don't get a proper reaction from people when you just say that. So Stephen stuck them all in the headsets. And they were wandering around the stage, looking at their environment, going, my god, this is what I'm looking at. You know, There's this, and there's this. And you can point to things, and you know where roughly where everything is. They get an idea of exactly what they're looking at. Plus, they get an idea of what their characters look like, the other actors as well. Um, H, in particular, was interesting because the character that she had in the movie is about eight feet tall, which is an interesting eyeline problem because when your actor is in the same eyeline as you, you're looking at her instead of looking up, which is where the final character was. So we actually had her on a box most of the time, <laughs> running around in the box. But the fact that they could see what the final character actually looked like made a huge difference because they got an idea of what it was they were reacting to. Um, Stephen and everyone else we always kept saying this was great and they wished he'd had it for other, mo other movies, which was terrific. That's a really big compliment to get. But another use <clears throat> we had for this was that we actually built virtual sets of all of what were going to become the physical sets that were going to be constructed later. Now, one of the biggest problems with that, with uh, constructing physical sets, is that quite often the only thing the director and the director of photography have to operate on to plan where they're going to put cameras is a, usually a physical small model, an architectural model. And that's somewhat very difficult to determine exactly what you intend to do with a camera. But with this, because we built all this physically in, in, uh, inside of a computer, we could put Stephen on a headset on, the main, on our main stage, and he could literally wander around it. And because he was there and we had um, Unity right there with editing capability, we could actually change the, the set as he asked for. Imagine, it, um, as in real time, as he was asking for it. So an example would be this originally did not have this pulpit area. This actually was just a flat corridor. And Stephen even said, oh, you know, I would really like a pulpit here. And we literally built a pulpit as he's standing there. He's like, yeah, bring it out further. I like that. That's great. The, the sixes scene as well here, um, this, you know, where the pillars were, were completely different places. He's like, no, can you move them? I want to move this. I've got... And he's planning in his mind where he's going to put his camera, what kind of camera tracks he wants to do. And he wants a physical set that's actually going to be something he can use. And he kept saying how great that was because usually he said, when you end up with a physical set, you get what you get. And either it's good enough or it's not. And if it's not, then they have to usually raise the whole set and rebuild it from scratch with the obvious cost incurred there. But with doing it in a computer, it's easy. Um, I think that's something that's going to actually happen a lot more in movies going forward, to be honest with you. Uh, that was a big thing, that, that it could be edited in real time. And at the end of it, we ended up with another FBX file that was a, you know, this is what the plans are going to be for what we build, which is kind of useful. Um, plus, he just likes to play with all the cool toys. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, we, he was running around and, and planning ideas of where was he going to put his cameras, what he was going to do, and, oh, I'd like to make the floor transparent so I can push a camera up through it, things like that. Um, the amount of pre-planning that could be done using these tools is, is dramatic, and pre-production time on a, on a big movie is very expensive, so anything you can do to shorten that is a good thing. So why do we use Unity for this and not Unreal? Um, well, Unreal is very good, there's no doubt about it. As an engine, Unreal, I think, and handles top-end graphics probably better than Unity does. Unity tends to have a cutoff point of scale. 
Uh, but the one thing that Unity has that Unreal doesn't is ease of entry. Trying to get things into Unreal and building an FBX and importing it is so much easier than it is in Unreal. Um, Unity has that, that ease of access. And when you're on a stage and Stephen suddenly goes, oh, you know, I'd like to be able to do this as well. Can we get this guy to hand this to that or whatever? It's a lot easier to do it in Unity than it is in Unreal, to be perfectly honest with you. The, the end results of Unreal, I think, are probably better. But on a motion capture stage, under the pre time pressures of let's get this done, you kind of have to go with what's easier than what might look prettier in the final product. Um, Unity certainly gave us enough of what we needed. Uh, I remember talking to um, his uh, director of photography, who's actually his, his lighting gaffer. It's kind of weird. Stephen's his own director of photography, and he has a lighting gaffer who's, who's whatever. Um, and he was really, really happy with the amount of lights that he could lay out in Unity. He was quite blown away by it because he could actually see what the final product was going to be. You know, we could do backlighting and all the rest of it. And he was really happy with it. And again, it was new technology that he'd never seen before. And, and yeah, he was really happy about it. So. Unity was quite adequate to the needs, and it had the, the, the ease of access and the ease of initial setup that was necessary. If I was going to actually physically really render a movie and really do it, I'd probably do it with Unreal, because Unreal's end results are better. But Unre Unreal requires so much tweaking and messing about with that it's difficult to get it done effectively in the time periods, you know, time available to you. Um, that is an actual fact of photon torpedo, and there is a scene at the, right at the very beginning of the movie where um, James Halloway, Halliday is inside of a photon torpedo, and the only reason I put that picture in there is because I walk past it every day on my way to my desk, and I didn't have the courage to actually take a picture of myself in it. <laughs> uh, that would have been instant dismissal too, as well as if I got caught, um, <clears throat> but it was pretty cool to be able to do that. Um, so that's pretty much it. <clears throat> Are there any uh, questions? I mean, that's, I, that's a really quick praise of exactly what we did. Here, but... Anyone have any questions? Hello. Hi. Thanks for the talk. That was great. Um, do you think it helped uh, the fact that you were shooting people in mocap um, scenes um, and they were actually playing characters who were wearing mocap suits in the film? For the actual sure, characters, I guess I never really thought about it like that. Yeah, it's probably probably. I mean, yeah, there was a certain amount of practical experience that you could actually bring to the bring to it. Um, I, it was funny to see the actors in terms of some of them really liked the whole mocap experience and some of them did not. I remember on uh, Christmas Carol, for example. Um, oh, I can't think of his name. Ah, oh, the beard, the guy with the beard. Um, mm. Sorry. Not you. Um, Bob Hoskins absolutely hated it. He absolutely detested the whole process, whereas other actors really liked it because it was all in Los Angeles, which means they could all go home at the end of the day, and there was no makeup. There was a certain degree of makeup because you had to have dots on your face, so all of the actors had to be clean-shaven every day. Um, some of the actors didn't like that very much. But, uh, but, yeah, they were really happy about the fact they could go home you know, every, morning, every night. Um, yeah, that might have made a difference. I guess I never really thought about it. It's one of the things that you find with mocap is that you tend to over emote in the same way that you do when you're on a, a theater stage. Because people are, you know, the, the mocap stuff is pretty good, but sometimes you have to overdo it a little bit just to get the, the emotions through of the body motions and things like that. Subtlety has no place on a mocap stage, let's put it that way. Hi, again, thank you for the talk. Yeah. Um, with Unity, were you using the vanilla version? Were you integrating any plugins for additional post effects? Because Unity can be very weak, like you were saying with DOF and certain lighting techniques and what have you. The, the plugins that we, we, yeah, it was native. We weren't using any rendering plugins, but we were using um, communications pro, uh, protocol called Photon and Boson um, that comes from Microsoft. Photon is um, actually, Boson is a communications protocol that actually Microsoft has patented that enables us to transport large numbers of bones between Motion Builder and Unity itself. In terms of this the pure rendering, no, we didn't use anything. We did actually look at it, but it, was a, it got to the point of, um, you know, okay, if we revise our version of Unity, does this plugin still work? And there's a, a dependency that we just didn't want to incur in terms of being on a stage this, when you're on a stage and there's 400 people standing around, what, the, the, the stuff that you have better work. 
And so if there were any issues with plugins or, or whatever it might have been, you know, we couldn't afford to have that happen. So we tended to use it natively. Um, it was fairly adequate, though, for the native stuff. And we didn't turn, some of the lighting, you know, could have been better. But a lot of that was also an amount, just the amount of time we had to build these things. You know, when you're building a full AAA game, you've got 18 months or two years to do it. We had three months of pre-pro and that was it. So the FBX scenes that we were importing were not particularly optimized for a proper rendering environment. Um, but that said, we still managed to get 60 frames per second most of the time on stage, on screen, and, and that was really necessary, so. Really interesting stuff, Jake. Um, I'm curious from a software standpoint how solid your software was uh, when it actually came to implementing and performing on stage. What are you trying to say? <laughs> I'm curious, uh, did you have the opportunity at night to either make enhancements oh, yes. or requests and kind of yes. tweak things? Yeah, 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 yeah. There's, um, so, for example, there was no... Um, inertia dampening, for example, and Stephen asked for it one day, and I spent all weekend working on inertia dampening and producing a new build for him on the, on the following Monday. Um, and there's a little story that goes with that, actually, which is, it's, it's kind of an aggrandizement story, and I hesitate to tell it, but I'm going to anyway, because I've got a big mouth. So, um, <clears throat> Monday when I came in, and I was watching Stephen on the stage using it, you know, I, I just want to watch him use it. He can create things with that, cam that virtual camera that I had no idea was possible. You know, sometimes he'd do shots and I would literally pick up the camera afterwards and try and replicate it and not be able to do it. The man is absolutely worth his money, if you know what I'm saying. He's really good. Um, and I'm standing on the side of the stage watching him and so a woman comes up to me and starts just ta passing the time of day and I don't know who she is and she doesn't know who I am. And she said, I've seen you here on the stage before, um, but I don't know what you do. And when you're on a stage and people don't know what you do, they, you tend to be you know, the lowest of the low. She said, what do you actually do? And I said, well, I'm the software guy that, that built the virtual camera software that Stephen's using. And she said, oh my God, he loves that. And I'm like, oh, does he? Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's a nice thing to hear. Oh, great. Yeah, he's really happy with it. He keeps trying to work out how to buy it from digital domain. And I kept saying, well, it's not just me. It's this whole bunch of production people who build the scenes that we use. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of artists pipeline that you don't see behind the scenes that's building this stuff. So, so it's, it's a bit more than just buying the software. There's a lot more involved in it. Um, anyway, it was, a, it was a really nice conversation. And after it was done, I, she walked away and I just sat there and thought, who are you? Because I have no idea who she was. Um, and eventually, I, I caught up with her again in Video Village where she was sitting on one of the director's chairs. And if you have your own director's chair on a stage, it has your name on the back. Uh, and when I actually looked and saw, I saw that it was actually Stephen's wife, um, which was kind of a nice thing. I got a nice unsolicited testimonial of the software. Now, in terms of, of robustness, I'll be honest with you, Motion Builder is not the most robust bit of software in the world anyway. And writing a plugin for it is not the easiest thing to do. And trying to keep it robust and not have issues, particularly threading issues, um, Motion Builder has some particularly nasty threading issues. Trying to maintain 60 frames per second with everything is difficult when you've got 10 characters that you're doing retargeting on and then trying to transmit that in real time at 60 hertz across a network. We actually had a dedicated network at, um, on the stage that was just there just for the transmission of bones from Motion Builder to Unity in order to try and keep that up. Um, it, yeah, it was difficult. And yes, we were making changes literally on the stage every, every other day. And that's why you have, you know, I was asked to be there and actually on the stage working on it. Because realistically, most of my work was done beforehand. But you never know what's going to get asked of you when you're there, new features, whatever it might be. I remember Gary de describing me the whole kind of motion builder to uh, Unity workflow. But I never really got a reason why motion builder was there. Motion builder is the... Open industry standard for retargeting. It's, it's a, a layout. It's not, an, it's not an animating package in like Maya is. It's designed, it has an enormous constraint engine built into it. And the constraint engine is what's used for skeletal retargeting. So the idea is that you can assign on individual bones, you can assign uh, this spring values to it and constraints to it. So that when the incoming actor's bones come in and you then retarget that to the final final body, as it were, you can stop arms from going too high or, you know, looking weird or whatever. And that's what Motion Builder does really, really well. It's designed for camera track layout, uh, so it's got all the camera definitions inside of it. Um, they're moving a lot of what Motion Builder does into Maya now, because Motion Builder is actually discontinued as of this year. Um, Autodesk doesn't support it anymore. Um, they've been doing development up until now, but they've just ended it. Um, and they're trying to move a lot of that software into Maya. 
But unfortunately, Maya is just as much of a bloated old bit of technology with, you know, with a lot of craft in it that you don't really want to be using that either. And there's some interesting moves by um, Epic who are trying to pull some of the motion builder functionality actually into Unreal. They have a group in Vancouver who's working on that full time now. Um, and I have high hopes for that because they, they're finally, Epic is finally looking at motion, you know, movies and stuff like that as a viable revenue stream. So they're actually spending time and making it attractive to it. So hopefully that'll be easier to use and we'll put you know, the next generation of virtual cameras will be directly in a video game engine rather than interfacing with motion builder, or at least hopefully anyway. Well, if I have anything to do with it. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank All you right. so much. Thank you for the great, uh, great speech.